Life Unrehearsed. Brought to you by Caregiver Crosswalk. Dementia Care Consulting. Never roam alone. And welcome back to Life Fun Rehearsed. I'm Matt Del Vecchio, specializing in life transitions, downsizing in the senior living industry. And I'm Corey Sirota, clinical social worker specializing in grief and loss. Matt, have you ever led a double life? <laughs> well, um, I would say for about 10 minutes, I was uh, Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> in a mini concert, surprised my wife Stephanie on our wedding day with a full blown concert of about three or four songs. So she didn't know she was marrying and Elvis, she, oh, hold Corey. On. And she's still married. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the Elvis career didn't go much further than right. that stage for, for good reason. <laughs> what about you? So I live, I would say currently, not even a double, triple, quadruple, I would say a quintuple, if not more, life because I wear many hats. I'm a mom, I'm an author, I'm a private practitioner, I'm a teacher, I'm a wife, I'm a radio co-host. The list goes on and on. The difference is all of those hats and roles that I play are very public and very known to everyone. Mm -hmm. Whereas our guests coming on over the years, there's no question that we have um, learned and seen and spoken to people that live all kinds of experiences. Well, Marcy Warhoff, she b suffered through incredible loss and trauma. It was um, very, very overwhelming at times for her to deal with this. So she had to find a way to cope. Her way was to lead a double life. We have Marcy Warhoff on the line right now. She's the author of The Good Stripper, a soccer mom's memoir of loss, lies, and lap dances. I cannot wait to have this discussion, Marcy. Welcome to Life Unrehearsed. Oh, thanks for having me. <laughs> it's funny to hear that's all about me. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so um, there's no question that from some of the information I have back learned and, and uh, explored, you've experienced a fair amount of trauma at a very, very relatively young age. So would you please share with us some of the events that occurred? Sure. I mean, I actually started off really lucky. Um, I had a really happy childhood, you know, typical two parents, brother, sister. I was a baby, very loved, very protective, very encouraged to speak my mind and, and, felt like I could rule the world. And I, and I felt like I did. And I always say, I, I kind of feel like I peaked when I was 10 years old. <laughs> like I really thought I could do anything. And then um, when I was 10, my father left, which, you know, wasn't great. He, he just left and left my mom to raise three kids on her own. And that was really difficult. However, my mother was spectacular. And the rest of us got closer. So there were challenges, but th that was the first kind of hit, but didn't kill me. When I was 17, my older brother, um, he got sick and he passed away. Mm -hmm. That changed my life. That uh, He was the sun and the moon and the stars to me. I always say he was the invisible armor I wore out in the world to protect me. He knew when to stand in front of me to protect me. He knew when to stand behind me, encouraging me to protect myself. Um, when he died, I felt it should have been me. I felt mm -hmm. that the world needed him more than it needed me. And that became my mantra for, for many, many years was it should, have, it should have been me. And so my self-worth went from like a million to zero. And going out in the world like that makes you pretty vulnerable. And, and right after he died, uh, a few months later, my stepfather was arrested for some major crimes. And then a few months after that, my mother got diagnosed with cancer, um, one of several times. And then I was kind of pushing through that and um, had developed a really severe eating disorder um, from the lack of control of my life. And that set me on a dangerous path. And then I got married and had two miscarriages. And then I got pregnant again. And my mom died while I was pregnant. So I didn't get a minute as a mom with my mom. And it was unexpected. And then I almost lost that baby when I was 34 weeks pregnant. And then I got pregnant again. And, and I got severely ill and spent two months in the hospital with kidney failure and respiratory failure. Um, and had to kind of learn how to walk and talk and breathe on my own again. Um, so that, that was, <laughs> that was before I was 30. So that, those kind of took their toll on me. It's unbelievable. I mean, just after the first couple things you mentioned, Marcy, and you just kept going on and on, I can't imagine what you had to go through. Uh, talk about a life on rehearsal. And we're talking with Marcy Warhaft. She's the author of The Good Stripper, A Soccer Mom's Memoir of Lost Lies and Lap Dances. And, um, you know, I can't, just listening to that trauma is difficult to hear. How in the world did you find a way to manage it all? I didn't. And that was what happened. That's what happens to most people, I think, 
when I, when my brother died, I couldn't handle it. So I, I focused on my eating disorder. And so I pushed the grief down. When my mother died, I was pregnant. So I had this baby to take care of. So I couldn't deal with her grief. I pushed that down. When I got sick, when I was pregnant again, I couldn't, I couldn't deal with, um, I, I had lost that baby, but I couldn't deal with that, with that loss because I had a 16 month old at home. I pushed that grief down. And I thought I was helping myself kind of by, by pushing it away. What I didn't realize was I was pushing it down deep inside me where it was doing the most damage. And so it, it ended up breaking me mm-hmm. years later. That, that was unexpected. There was too much trauma and it, and it, it did break me. With no question, Marcy, I mean, my heart breaks listening to the stories as you've heard. I'm a grief, loss, and bereavement specialist, mm-hmm. so I hear these kinds of challenges and tragedies, not to the extent that you're sharing, but all the time, and I always say no one can escape it, and unfortunately, mm-hmm. you're, you lived experience of recognizing that you can't escape it. So what I understood, though, was one of the things you started to do to help make ends meet is you became a dancer at a strip club. Well, it wasn't, it, I have to clarify, it wasn't to make ends meet, and that's oh. the thing. I was, I was married, I had two little kids, my, my husband at the time was making a good living. It wasn't that. It was, I experienced traumatic overload, as it was explained to me, and I couldn't handle anything else. And my marriage was very complicated at the time. I was not getting the support. He'd been fantastic for, for a lot of things, but at this point, I was peaking in my trauma, did not get the support I needed. I was made to feel, I felt that I, I had two purposes. I was to be the best mom that I could be. I really wanted that. But I also felt like the only thing I had to offer the world was my body and myself sexually. And so I, I, gave, I, I gave all the love I could to my kids, but I felt completely unloved and unwanted. Um, and I felt that the only way I could get attention was through my body. And so I started, I, well, because I felt that that was all I had to offer, when I needed money to contribute to the, to the household, um, I, I, I went to dancing because I wanted to be with my kids all day and have a job where I could be making money but also be with my kids all day. So I wouldn't sleep for a couple of days because I would literally be with my kids, go dance, come home, go to the gym, take a shower, be up with my kids. But it, it wasn't the dance. That, but that was part of the double life. But it, it took a darker turn. And I started confusing being sexual with being sexualized. And... Mm-hmm. Uh, because my self-esteem was so low and because I thought that's all I had to offer the world, I was this mom during the day and then I was like the town vixen <laughs> when I wasn't with my kids. And, and that, again, ended up taking its toll. It took me away from my traumas in a way because when you're so focused on, I was so detached sure. from my body, so disconnected, at the same time so hyper-focused on it. Between the eating disorder and the sexual stuff, I was disconnected while being totally hyper-focused on it, and that nearly broke me. This is Marcy Warhaft talking about her life and, and uh, actually leading a bit of a double life here, as you've heard, uh, um, mom by day and um, exotic dancer by, by night. One of the things uh, that I wanted to ask you, Marcy, is you talked about uh, eating disorders, and then as you were turning things around, you started focusing on body image, and you started something, I believe, called Fit versus Fiction. What's that about? Yeah. So I ended up having kind of a slap in the face moment that, that made me change my life. And I got healthy. I went into treatment for my eating disorder and, and my kids were little and I did not like the messages that they were getting in school about health. It was all about losing weight instead of gaining health. And because of my experience with eating disorder and body image, I became very outspoken about it. And I started, anytime I'd hear something on the radio or watch something on TV I didn't like that I thought was a negative message for kids, I would call and speak out. And nobody was talking about eating disorders at the time. It's not glamorous. No. You know, this is before Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I started speaking. And then I, I started speaking at schools. And then it was word of mouth. And I, I, this program was I would go to schools. I would go to sports places with kids. I would speak to social workers. And, um, and I would spread this message telling, just teaching kids about media manipulation and um, all, the, all the negative messages that come at them, telling them that they're not okay, I was giving an alternative message. I was, I was explaining to them how they are okay and how self-worth isn't measured in pounds. And, and really making a contribution. And, and, and um, you know, just when you were thinking things were getting mm-hmm. a bit more normal, you're making a difference in the lives of many, many kids, mm-hmm. you start to feel a tremendous amount of shame. And we'd like to hear how you're able to deal with this shame and guilt that you had. Before. Life Unrehearsed, brought to you by Leanna Senior Transition Support, specialists in downsizing and seniors' residences. 
Hi there, and welcome back. You're listening to Life Unrehearsed. I'm Corey Sirota, along with my co-host, Matt Del Vecchio, who is sitting across from me in the studio at an appropriately socially distanced uh, distance, uh, area. So we are here talking with Marcy Warhoff about overcoming trauma and leading a double life as a traditional soccer mom by day and exotic dancer by night. Marcy, uh, your story is a very powerful one. I understand that as you journey, you hit this point in which you've started to feel a tremendous amount of shame and guilt. Can you share a little bit more about that with us? Yeah, that took me a while to even understand what was happening, but I, I had changed my life and I was in a better place and I was healthy and I was contributing and I was, I was helping people. Great feeling. I was almost in my element again, but I had this, this shame and this fear, I'd say shame and fear overpowered me. I was afraid that my past would come back to haunt me. And not so much for me, I was afraid that my children would know what I did and then that they would be harmed by it, that it would hurt them. I was afraid um, that I wouldn't be able to continue what I was doing with helping kids because I'd be looked at completely differently. And I felt so guilty over what I had done when really I was just I know now what I needed to do to survive through my trauma, but I felt so bad about it that I felt like I was being a hypocrite. I felt that here I am, you know, trying to tell people to, to appreciate themselves and love themselves, and I couldn't accept myself. I felt that, that people were saying, giving me accolades for, for what I was doing, and yet I felt like I was, no, you don't know me. I'm a, I'm a bad person. I've done bad things. Mm. And that, that overwhelmed me, and, and I ended up relapsing with my eating disorder. I ended up um, letting myself be involved in situations where I was disrespected. Um, and I thought they deserved that. I thought they didn't deserve to be happy. And it got to a point where I would literally drive my kids to school. And on the way back, every day for about a year, I would look at the underpass and, and think, maybe if I turn my wheel just a little bit to the right, um, would, it, would it hurt? Would it be quick? And I thought, for the longest time, I thought, I can't do that to my children. I know what it's like to grow up without a mother, and I, I wouldn't do that to them. But it got to a point where I thought maybe they'd be better off. Sure. Maybe yeah. everyone would mm-hmm. be better off mm-hmm. if I wasn't here. And it was, a, it was a conversation with a stranger that I had at the grocery store that I talk about in my book I, that completely changed the way I, I felt. And I went home and I, I cried and I thought, no, this is, it. this is not how my story ends. This isn't it. I haven't made it this far, as they say, to just make it this far. And I washed my face and I, I felt and, and said, things are going to change. And it, it was slow. It was a slow process. But I had to let go of that shame right. and start loving that person that, that I was and, and, and being more compassionate to all the parts of me, even the parts that I wasn't happy with. I had to, to give, almost give them more love and, and nurturing and know that I did the best I could with what I had. And that's, that's what I think is so important for people to learn is that we go through, so many of us go through trauma and challenges and we make it out the other side and we may have to... We may be climbing and, and breaking our nails and clawing the walls to get there, but we get there. And instead of saying, I survived, I made it, we look back and judge how we did it. It was too slow. It was messy. It was dirty. And then we get stuck there. Mm-hmm. Instead of saying, you know, we, we, we get stuck saying, I made it, but instead right. of saying, I made it, period, end of story, I've learned, and now it's time to move on and enjoy the rest of my life. That's what I started doing. And that's what I want. That's what I really want for people to, to let themselves do it, enjoy the rest of their life. You're listening to Life on Rehearse with Matt and Corey, and we're talking to the Marcy War, have an incredible story, um, Soccer Mom's Memoir of Lost Lives and Lap Dances. And uh, Marcy, we have to talk about the book, uh, The Good Stripper, A Soccer Mom's Memoir of Lost Lies and Lap Dances. You're getting rave reviews. This must have been an incredible, um, sometimes perhaps overwhelming uh, mm-hmm. experience for you. And could you quickly tell us about making the book, and I'm sure it must have been therapeutic for you as well. It was, it was therapeutic in the sense that even as I was writing it, there were things that I hadn't quite forgiven myself for. And as I'm writing it, I realized, oh, wait a minute. I get why I thought that. Hmm. I get why I did that. I think everyone should write a book because it really does. <laughs> it, it, makes you, it gets yeah. it out of your head and yeah. onto paper, and you realize, wait a minute, that makes sense now. Um, but it's, it's very, look, I'm raw now and I'm open. All those secrets that I was terrified of coming out, I put out into the world. But what I've learned was I was afraid the secrets 
were going to kill me. The secrets weren't killing me. It was the fear over the secrets. So I've let that fear go. I've released the secrets, and I'm stronger for it. No question about that, Marcy. The, the learning and the message that you're sharing with our listeners is exquisite about recognizing and leaning into the shame mm-hmm. or the feelings so that you can let go of them. Right. Your story is really of resilience. Uh, we just got a text, actually. As we're, I hope a movie deal's in the works for you, Marcy. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that. I know. That's funny. It's, well, you know, crazy. you're extremely courageous and, and, and brave, and, and you put it all out there, like you say. Wonderful book. I saw a post the other day where uh, you were in very good company, I think, at one of the bookstores. And, and uh, you know, good on you for um, getting the attention because although the double life of lap dancing and so on is kind of a, um, what people may remember, it is so much more about overcoming yeah. loss and shame and I think so many people can relate to that. And um, just as we as we wrap it up, any final words, Marcy, that you would like our listeners to hear? Honestly, it sounds so cliche, but this is it. You've got one life. Live it as authentically and as you as you can. The more you and honest that you are, the right people will come to you. Whoever doesn't get it, they don't need to get it. But just this is it. Don't get to the end of your life and think, I should have said or I should have done. Just do it. Thank you so much, Marcy. Uh, Yes, just do it. I quite agree with you. Everyone does have a book inside them. Whether or not they publish it is totally separate from the fact that everyone has a story and uh, and an important one to tell. How do people get a hold of your book? Uh, Amazon. uh, Or they can order from Amazon or from Chapters, either online or in stores, or my publisher at Sutherland House Books. Wonderful. All right, Marcy, thanks so much for joining us and taking some time. Thank you. All right. Corey, we've got a a, a great show lined up next week. What do we have coming up? Well, in recognition of Crohn's and Colitis Awareness Month, we're going to learn some of the causes of what causes Crohn's and colitis and what can be done to help people who are suffering with uh, IBD or irritable bowel syndrome. Yeah, and we're very proud to have the mayor of Hampstead, Dr. Bill Steinberg, will be on the show next week. He's a cochlear implant recipient and an advocate for those experienced hearing loss. Uh, He's got such an incredible story as well to tell. So we'd like to thank all of you for listening today on Life on Rehearse. And we want to thank, of course, our technical producer, David Simon. And you could listen to Life on Rehearse every Sunday at 4 p.m. on CJD 800.